This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Greetings, friends. You're listening to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dustin Smith, and as always, I will be your host. This here is episode 167, entitled Mark's High Human Christology, Chapter 9. Now, I hope that you all had a nice celebratory Resurrection Sunday. In this week's episode, we will look at the high Christological statements in Mark, Chapter 9. As you will recall in this series, we are deliberately going out of our way to look at possible interpretations of Mark's Christology in order to see if the most exalted readings are persuasive and valid. Thus far, we have discerned that Mark's Christology is high, but it is a high human Christology where Jesus is greatly authorized as the supreme agent of the only true God. And Jesus functions in this capacity as God's human Messiah. Today, we will look at the transfiguration of Jesus, where many have concluded that Jesus reveals his divinity before Peter, James, and John. Next, We will look at the Son of Man who is to be killed and see if this makes sense in light of theories wherein Jesus has two natures, a divine nature that is immortal and a human nature that dies on the cross. Lastly, we will look at Jesus openly admitting that he has been sent by God. And we will examine if this sending implies a sending from heaven, from a state of preexistence. Will Mark chapter 9 reveal that Jesus is to be understood as God and not as a human being? Let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today is the transfigured Jesus. I'll be reading out of Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them, along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. And a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, Listen to him. All at once, they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. That's Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. So, six days after Jesus says that some of you standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power, has Mark following this story with the events of the transfiguration, where Jesus takes with him only some of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. And thus, Jesus is transfigured before these disciples. Now, what happens when Jesus is transfigured? Well, his garments begin to glow. They become exceedingly white, and he himself was changed. Could it be that Mark is trying to tell his readers that this is the time that Jesus is revealing the fact that he is really divine? Now, I think this is 
an unlikely conclusion. Mainly because Mark seems to be deliberately portraying Jesus on this mountain in specific ways that recall Moses' experience on the mountain. I'm going to point out to you the ways that Mark frames the story that seems to parallel and even deliberately recall the accounts of Moses on the mountain where Moses spoke to God. So, Moses act as a mediator between God and representatives of the covenant community. And now Jesus acts as the mediator between God and the chosen three. The scene between Moses and Jesus is the same. Moses went up on a high mountain, and Jesus went up on a high mountain. We learn from Exodus 24, verse 16, that Moses waited six days before going on the mountain, and Jesus also waited six days before going on top of the mountain. With Moses, there was a radiant transformation that took place to the point to where Moses' own face shone. Exodus 34, verse 35. But with Jesus, there's a transfiguration taking place, resulting in a similar shining, this time of Jesus' clothing. So Moses has a transformation, and Jesus has a transformation, both of which involve the effect of glowing and shining. Now on the mountain, God reveals to Moses the plans for the tabernacle. Exodus 25, verse 9. And with Jesus, we have the three disciples requesting to make three tabernacles. Another interesting connection, which I think is very powerful, involves Moses encountering God by a voice coming out of a cloud. Exodus 24, verse 16. And Jesus also encounters God by a voice coming out from a cloud. So nearly every single detail of the story seems to deliberately recall Moses' own experience on the mountain. But instead of God speaking to Moses on the mountain, we now have God speaking to Jesus. Mark seems to be making Jesus into the new Moses. And if Mark is portraying Jesus as the new Moses and not as a divine figure, then the statement made by God in the form of a cloud on this mountain seems to connect Jesus to Moses in a very significant way. Recall what God in the cloud said in Mark chapter 9? God said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. God identifies Jesus, but specifically, God tells the people that they need to listen to Jesus. Now, if you will recall Deuteronomy chapter 18, we learn that there is a prophet like Moses in whom God is going to place his own words. I'll read to you this passage, Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 15. It says, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. And then in verse 18, God says, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself require it of him. That's Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 18 through 19. So we have the prophecy of a prophet coming like Moses, in whom God is going to speak, and the call in Deuteronomy 18 is that you shall listen to him. He shall speak to them all that I command him. Whoever does not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, heightens the importance of those words. So Jesus is not revealing his divinity 
in the account of the transfiguration, what are we to make of this story? Well, what are we to make of all of the shining clothes and the glorified imagery? What do we make of this? Well, there are some other New Testament depictions of Jesus after his resurrection and glorification that portray him just as we see within this transfiguration story. When Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, recalls the story of Paul's conversion in a variety of places, it shows up three times in the book of Acts, chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26. Paul seems to describe the risen and exalted Jesus in terms of a bright light. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 3, Paul describes it as a light from heaven. In Acts 22 verse 6, he describes it as a very bright light. And in Acts 26 verse 13, it is a light that is brighter than the sun. Now when the resurrected and exalted Jesus appears to John the Revelator on the island of Patmos in Revelation 1, 15 through 16, there are similar shining characteristics of Jesus. So it would seem that the transfigured Jesus from Mark chapter 9 is very likely a vision of Jesus in his future kingdom glory. I think that's the way that Mark wants his readers to see this. It is a vision of Jesus in his future kingdom glory. And this also makes sense of the fact that we have Moses and Elijah now who appear to be resurrected in this vision because Moses and Elijah have been dead for hundreds of years. And for what it's worth, when Matthew redacted Mark's gospel and Matthew wrote his account of the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, Matthew explicitly calls the transfiguration a vision, the Greek noun or Rama. I think Matthew is making clear what is unspoken in Mark's narrative. So in the transfiguration, is Jesus revealing that he is divine? I think this is unlikely what Mark wanted his readers to conclude with this particular story. What we can say for certain is that Jesus is the new Moses, who is authorized by God to speak God's words as an agent. Let's move on to our second point. Point number two, the suffering son of man previously written. We have Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. It's Mark chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. So, okay, we got Moses and Elijah appearing to Jesus in the transfiguration vision. We're going to call it a vision. And I can understand Moses because Jesus is appearing as the new Moses, speaking the words of God as this end times prophet that was promised to Moses in Deuteronomy 18. But what are we to make of Elijah? Well, Elijah seems to be identified here with the deceased John the Baptist, who is the other end times prophet. According to Malachi chapter 4, is the one who is going to restore the hearts of the fathers before God comes to strike the earth in judgment. So Moses shows up, pointing to Jesus as the prophet like Moses, and Elijah shows up, 
pointing to John the Baptist, who was the one preparing the way for Jesus as the new Elijah. Now, Jesus says that they did to Elijah slash John as they wished, but what about the Son of Man? Jesus said that the Son of Man will suffer, and Jesus also said that this was written in Scripture. What does Jesus mean by the Son of Man who is to suffer as it is written? I think the first thing we need to do is determine what Son of Man means. Now, it's not uncommon for those who think that Mark teaches a Jesus with dual natures, wherein Jesus is 100% divine and 100% human, to regard statements about the Son of Man to refer to Jesus' humanity, while statements about the Son of God refer to Jesus' divinity. This is a common way that evangelicals interpret the death of Jesus, and since we just finished Easter, Resurrection Sunday, this might be fresh on people's mind. Well, yes, Mark does say that the Son of Man will suffer, die, and rise from the dead, but if this is just a reference to Jesus' humanity, then, according to a dual nature interpretation, it is possible for a divine Jesus, who cannot die because he's immortal, to still fit within Mark's Christology. And this is actually how many people understand the death of Jesus while holding on to their post-biblical theology that they got from the creeds. So we need to get at the bottom of what Son of Man means. And what does it mean that the Son of Man's rejection and death was written about within the Old Testament, within the Hebrew Bible. What sort of possibilities do we have when looking at passages within the Hebrew Bible that talk about a figure that is going to suffer and die? Well, the obvious answer to most people is Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 speaks of the death of the suffering servant. The problem, though, is that Jesus says that it is the Son of Man who is going to suffer, and it is the Son of Man about whom it was written. And there is no Son of Man figure in Isaiah 53. That is about the suffering servant. I don't think Isaiah 53 is in Mark's mind. What about Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2? which is a passage that could be hinting towards a resurrection of sorts on the third day. If someone is being raised, then certainly they have died. The problem with this interpretation is that, again, there is no mention of the Son of Man in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. Where do we get the enigmatic figure of the Son of Man? Well, it is a figure in Daniel chapter 7 where, according to verses 13 through 14, the Son of Man is given God's dominion, glory, and kingship. Now, some will immediately respond and say that, hey, look, you can read Daniel chapter 7, and the Son of Man is not portrayed as a suffering figure. He's not portrayed as a figure that dies or is in any sort of opposition. But this... I'm going to respectfully argue, is a misreading of Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, as the vision continues within the chapter, if you read beyond verses 13 through 14, depicts the Son of Man as a representative figure for the, quote, people of the Holy Ones of the Most High, end quote in chapter 7, verse 27. So in Daniel 7, we have these beasts that come out of the sea, but we learn that they're not really beasts. Those are just symbolic images to refer to nations. The beasts are representative figures of the nations. Those beasts are identified with the sea, the chaotic waters, the forces of evil. But the Son of Man 
is another representative figure. And he is defined and unpacked, according to verse 27, as a representative of the people of the Holy Ones of the Most High. So just as the beast represent nations, the Son of Man represents the people of the Holy Ones of the Most High within the apocalyptic imagery of Daniel chapter 7. So who are these people? Who are these people of the Holy Ones of the Most High within Daniel 7? Answer, they are those who are contending with this little horn figure that is identified with a chaotic beast that has come up out of the Holy See. Look at how this conflict is described within Daniel chapter 7. In verse 21, Daniel says, I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. We can see that there is a conflict between this horn that is representing a beast that has come out of the sea, and that horn is overpowering and waging war with the saints, representing the people of the Most High. That's in Daniel 7.21. And then down a few verses later, in 7.25, it says that he, the little horn, will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. The passage goes on and it says that they, the saints, will be given into his hand, into the hand of the little horn. So the people of the Holy Ones of the Most High are in conflict. In fact, that they are seemingly losing this conflict. They are being worn down. They are given into his hand. They are losing the war that is being waged with them. They are being overpowered. So Daniel chapter 7 does indeed depict a human figure who represents the righteous suffering people. And I think that Jesus understood his mission as that Son of Man figure. Jesus understood that he is the human representative of the people of God. He is the one who would take upon their suffering unto himself all the way to the grave. So since Daniel chapter 7 portrays the Son of Man as an authorized human being who is empowered by the Ancient of Days, distinct from the Ancient of Days, and who acts as a representative of the people of God, then the Son of Man in Mark is not a description of some impersonal human nature that Jesus possesses in his person alongside a divine nature. The Son of Man is the authorized agent of God who suffers on behalf of God's people, just as it is written in Daniel chapter 7. I think it's unlikely that Mark, by describing Jesus as the Son of Man, is trying to slice into this supposed division of Jesus to where Jesus might have two natures. No, the Son of Man is not a reference to Jesus' humanity as distinct from his divinity. Jesus only has one nature, that of humanity as a human being. We should not read Son of Man as a label to a human nature. It should be the label as the representative for human beings that Jesus takes upon himself. Okay, point number three, our third and final point, which is Jesus as the agent of God. Mark chapter 9, verses 36 through 37 is our passage. Let's begin reading. Taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. That's Mark chapter 9, verses 36 through 37. So Jesus takes a child, and children were regarded in the Greco-Roman world as persons that are unwanted. Children often died due to being left out in the weather or being abandoned. 
not so much within Jewish communities, but within pagan communities and Gentile communities, this was a common thing to happen to children. It's very sad. Jesus teaches here that we are to accept children in his name, and those who accept him receive Jesus, but they're not really receiving Jesus. They're receiving the one who sent Jesus, giving high value to children at large. Now, some might be thinking of the Gospel of John as the book that emphasizes the fact that Jesus has been sent by God. However, Mark is the earliest gospel to make this point. The Father sent Jesus, and that much is clear. But we need to ask if this reference in Mark 9.37 is a subtle hint that Mark is thinking that Jesus was perhaps sent from heaven, perhaps even having pre-existed in heaven before being born. In other words, does the sending language used here imply pre-existence? Let's look at how Mark, within his gospel, uses sending language. We can start in Mark chapter 1 and verse 2, where it speaks of God sending his messenger. This messenger turns out to be John the Baptist. So yes, God here is doing some sending, but we don't get the impression that John the Baptist pre-existed in heaven prior to being sent. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, we have Jesus performing a sending. He sends out the 12 apostles. The sending here is actually a commissioning, a commissioning to go and perform ministry. And of course, Jesus is not sending the apostles from a pre-existent state, nor is he sending the apostles to earth from heaven. A little bit along the same lines is chapter 6 and verse 7, where Jesus again sends out the twelve. This time he sends them out in pairs. Here is another commissioning in the form of a sending, where they are sent out to perform ministry, summon people unto repentance, and to perform exorcisms. Moving along, in chapter 6 and verse 27, we have King Herod. This here is Herod Antipas sending out an executioner to, unfortunately, behead John the Baptist. In chapter 8, verse 26, we have Jesus sending the blind man whose sight is restored back to his home. Now, another relevant passage moves beyond what we've already studied into chapter 12, and I think this passage is relevant for us as we study the sending language that is used in Mark. Not only because the verb, apostello, shows up multiple times, but also we have God as the subject of the sending, which is just what we have in our present passage, to where God has sent Jesus. So in Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, we have a variety of acts of sending performed by none other than God himself. In chapter 12 and verse 2, God sends a servant to the vine growers. It's very likely that this is interpreted as God sending or commissioning one of the prophets that we see within the Old Testament. In 12 verse 4, we have much of the same. God sends another servant. This servant is wounded and shamed. In the next verse, 12 verse 5, God sends yet another this servant, unfortunately, is killed. And the verse actually goes on to indicate that God has sent many others. So God sends many prophet figures. But then in verse 6, God is sending his son, God's beloved son. But the same verb is used to express the sending of various rejected servants in 12 verses 2, 4, and 5 as is used in the sending of the Son in 12, verse 6. There's no indication that the sending of the Son is different from the previous sendings of the various servants. 
So what can we discern from Mark's use of sending language throughout his gospel? Well, we can see that Mark uses the sending language to regularly describe the commissioning of agents to perform a task. The sending always involves a sender who ranks higher than the sent agent. And that's a very important point. The one who is sent ranks lower than the one who sent him in every single occurrence. There is never an indication where the sending in Mark's gospel involves someone being sent from heaven. Neither are the references in Mark's gospel of sending where someone has a pre-existent state of being that gets sent into an incarnate mode of living. Now, when God is specifically the sender, the agents are always prophetic figures, like John the Baptist in chapter 1, the servants in chapter 12, or the Son of God who functions as a prophetic figure in chapter 12 and verse 6. So when we look back on our passage and we go back to finding a persuasive answer to our question, does the fact that Jesus was sent by God imply that he was sent from heaven? Or could it even imply that Jesus was sent from a state of preexistence to a human mode of living? We can say for sure that God is the one that has sent Jesus, but there's really no indication at all given by Mark that the sending is anything more than a commissioning of Jesus as an authorized agent. There is no mention of a sending from heaven, nor is there a mention of a sending from a pre-incarnate state. Now, interpreters are free to read those things back into the text, but those things are certainly not the things that Mark himself has said or has even given us legitimate hints at uncovering. So, in conclusion, we have observed that the Christology of Mark's Gospel is far from boring. It is dynamic, it is nuanced, and it is high. While at the same time, Mark's Christology carefully distinguishes Jesus from God rather frequently. We first noted that the Transfiguration story portrayed Jesus on the mountain in terms that recalled Moses on the mountain. Mark depicts Jesus as an authorized prophet like Moses in whom God has placed his words, making Jesus into the human mouthpiece of God. Second, we look at yet another saying of Jesus where he predicts that the Son of Man is to be betrayed, killed, and risen from the dead. By looking at the Son of Man figure, we concluded that Mark was likely drawing on Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man is both highly empowered by the Ancient of Days, in addition to functioning as the human representative for the suffering people of God. Lastly, we observe that while Mark portrays Jesus as having been sent by God, this likely indicates a commissioning for an important ministry by a superior to a lesser ranked agent. Mark gives absolutely no indication that Jesus was sent from heaven or from a pre-existent state of being. The Jesus that Mark describes in what we call the ninth chapter is a highly authorized human being acting as the agent of the one true God. This is certainly high Christology, but it is a high human Christology. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Join us next week as we continue to uncover the Christology in the Gospel of Mark, looking into chapter 10. If you've enjoyed these podcasts, please consider supporting us as we promote these important truths about the oneness and unity of God and the humanity of Jesus. 
If you like the podcast, go to iTunes and give it a five-star rating. Share it with your friends. And if you feel led to offer a donation, you may check out the episode's description for a link to PayPal. Special thanks to our producer and editor, Dustin Williams, for his fine work each and every week. My name is Dustin Smith. Until next time, you folks take care.